During the first conference on cyberspace, Sandy Stone provided articulation of what can, in retrospect, be identified as one of the guiding principles of life on the internet. No matter how virtual the subject becomes, she wrote, there is always a body attached. What Stone sought to point out with this brief but insightful comment is the fact that despite what appears online, users of computer networks and digital information systems should always remember that behind the scenes or the screen, there is always another human user. This other may appear in the guise of different virtual characters, screen names, profiles, or avatars, but there is always some buddy behind it all. This internet folk wisdom has served us well. It has helped users navigate the increasingly complicated social relationships made possible by computer-mediated communication. It has assisted law enforcement agencies in hunting down conmen, scam artists, and online predators. And perhaps most importantly, it has helped us sort out difficult ethical questions concerning individual responsibility and the rights of others. But all of that is now over, and it is over precisely because we can no longer be entirely certain that there is always a body attached. In fact, the majority of online activity is no longer, and perhaps never really was, communication with other human users, but interactions with machines. Current statistics concerning web traffic already give the machines a slight edge with 51% of all activity being otherwise than human. And this statistic is expected to increase at an accelerated rate. Even if one doubts the possibility of ever achieving what has traditionally been called strong AI, the fact is our world is already populated by semi-intelligent artifacts, social robots, autonomous algorithms, and other smart devices that occupy the place of the other in social relationships and communicative interactions. So what I propose to do today is investigate the opportunities and the challenges made available by these increasingly responsible machines. Machines that are designed for and are able to respond to us as another autonomous agent, and in so doing may have a legitimate claim to some level of rights responsibilities, or both. My examination of this will proceed in three steps or movements. The first will review the way we typically deal with technology and moral responsibility. I call it the default setting. It will, therefore, target and reconsider the instrumental theory of technology, which defines the machine as nothing more than a tool or a contrivance of human interests. The second part will consider the opportunities and the challenges that autonomous technologies pose to this default setting. Recent developments in robotics, learning algorithms, and decision-making systems exceed the conceptual boundaries of the instrumental theory and ask us to reassess who or what is a moral subject. Finally, and by way of conclusion, the third part will draw out the consequences of this material, explicating what this machine incursion means for us our world, and the other entities we encounter here. Now, initially, the very notion of responsible machines probably sounds absurd. Who in their right mind would pitch an argument for this? Who would dare suggest that a technological artifact could or should be considered an autonomous agent? Don't we already have enough trouble with human beings? So why muddy the water? And this line of reasoning sounds intuitively correct. In fact, it seems there's very little to talk about here. Machines, even sophisticated information processing devices like computers, smartphones, software algorithms, robots, etc., are technologies. And technologies, we know, are tools created and used by human beings. A mechanism or a technological object means nothing and does nothing by itself. It is the way it is employed by a human user that ultimately matters. 
Now this explanation sounds correct because it is structured and informed by what we call the instrumental theory of technology, a theory that Andrew Feenberg argues is the most widely accepted view of technology. And this theory applies not only to simple devices like corkscrews and garden hoses, but also sophisticated systems like computers and artificial intelligence. Computer systems, Deborah Johnson writes, are produced, distributed, and used by people engaged in social practices and meaningful pursuits. This is as true of current computer systems as it will be of future computer systems. No matter how independently, automatic, and interactive computer systems of the future behave, they will be the products of human behavior, human social institutions, and human decision. Consequently, the instrumental theory not only sounds reasonable, it is obviously useful. It is, one might say, instrumental for parsing questions of moral responsibility in the age of increasingly complex technological systems. And it has a distinct advantage in that it locates accountability in a widely accepted and seemingly intuitive subject position, in human decision-making and action and it resists any and all efforts to defer responsibility to some inanimate object by blaming or scapegoating what are mere instruments, contrivances, or tools. Now, the instrumental theory has served us well, and it has helped us make sense of all kinds of technological innovation, from simple hand tools to atomic bombs, rocket ships, and now personal computers. But I would argue all of that is now over. And it is over precisely because our machines no longer function as mere instruments. In other words, the instrumental theory is no longer a useful tool for understanding technological innovation. So let's consider three practical examples. First, interpersonal communication, especially in the area of customer service, either over the telephone or via online chat. Here the machine no longer occupies the position of medium between human users, but has increasingly become the other in these communicative interactions. When you contact your bank to apply for credit, for instance, your call is often taken by a friendly human operator. This human being, however, is not the active agent in the conversation. He or she is only an interface to a machine, which ultimately analyzes your application and makes all the decisions. This situation, in fact, inverts the usual roles and assumptions of computer-mediated communication. In these cases, the machine is the active agent and the interlocutor. The human operator is only an instrument or medium through which machine-generated decisions pass and are conveyed. Second, look at what has happened to financial and commodity exchange markets in the last decade. At one time, trades on the New York Stock Exchange or the Chicago Board Options Exchange were initiated and controlled by human traders in what we call the pit. Beginning in the late 1990s, financial services organizations began developing complex algorithms to take over much of this effort. These algorithms were faster, more efficient and more consistent, and as a result of all this, could turn incredible profits by exploiting momentary dif differences in market prices. These algorithms made decisions and initiated actions faster than human comprehension and were designed with learning subroutines in order to respond to new and unanticipated opportunities. And these things worked brilliantly. They pumped out incredible profits for the financial services industry, and as a result, over 70% of all trades are now machine-generated or controlled. What this means for us is that our finances, not only our mortgages and retirement funds, but also a significant part of our national economy, is now directed and managed by machines. And the consequences of this can be seen in an event that we call the flash crash. 
At about 2.45 p.m. on 6 May 2010, the Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 1,000 points in a matter of seconds and then rebounded just as quickly. The drop, which amounted to about 9% of the market's value, or 1 trillion U.S. dollars, was caused by some bad decision-making by a couple of trading algorithms. In other words, no human beings were in control of this event or responsible for its occurrence. It was something initiated by machines, and human brokers could only watch it unfold on their monitor screens, not knowing what had happened or why. To this day, no one is quite sure what occurred. In fact, no one knows who or what to blame for this loss of value. <coughs> Finally, a less nefarious illustration of machine autonomy can be found in situations involving the consumption and production of culture. Currently, recommendation algorithms at Netflix, Amazon, and elsewhere decide what cultural objects we experience. It is now estimated that 75% of all content that is obtained through Netflix, for example, is the result of a machine-generated recommendation. These algorithms, then, are taking over the role of film, book, and music critics, influencing, to a significant degree, what films we see, what books we read, and what music we hear. But machines are not just involved in distribution and exhibition. They are also actively engaged on the creative side. In the field of journalism, for instance, algorithms now write original content. Beyond the simple news aggregators that currently populate the web, these programs like Northwestern University's Stats Monkey automatically compose publishable stories from machine-readable data. <coughs> and organizations like the Big Ten Network use these systems to generate unique content for web distribution. These programs, although clearly in the early stages of development, recently led Kurt Cagel, the managing editor of XMLToday.org, to provocatively ask whether an artificial intelligence system might successfully compete for and win a Pulitzer Prize by 2030. Similar things are happening in the world of music with David Cope's Emmy, an algorithmic composer capable of creating new classical music scores that are virtually indistinguishable from the masterworks of Bach, Chopin, and Beethoven. And then there's Shimon, a marimba playing jazz bot from Georgia Tech University that not only improvises with human musicians in real time, but is capable of creating and performing entirely new musical compositions. Although the extent to which one might assign agency or responsibility to these mechanisms remains a rather contested issue, what is not debated is the fact that the rules of the game have changed significantly. <coughs> As a result of all this, the instrumental theory of technology, which had effectively tethered machine action to human agency, no longer adequately applies to mechanisms like these that have been deliberately designed to operate and exhibit some form, no matter how rudimentary, of machine learning, independent action, or autonomous decision making. This does not mean it is important to emphasize that the instrumental theory is on this account simply refuted or obsolete. There are, and will continue to be, mechanisms understood and utilized as tools to be manipulated by human users, things like lawnmowers, corkscrews, garden hoses, telephones, digital cameras, whatever. The point is that the instrumental definition, no matter how useful and seemingly correct for some circumstances for explaining some technological devices, does not exhaust all possibilities for all kinds of devices. So where does this leave us? Let me conclude with a couple of statements that have, at this particular point in time, something of an apocalyptic tone. First, we are living through that robot apocalypse that had been predicted by countless science fiction stories, novels, and films. Machines have infiltrated every aspect of our lives. 
They may have begun by displacing workers on the factory floor, but they now actively participate in all aspects of our intellectual, social, and cultural existence. This invasion is not some future possibility coming from a distant alien world. It is here, it is now, and resistance is futile. Second, since there is no escaping it, what matters is how we respond to this opportunity or challenge. In other words, what is important here and now is what we decide to do in the face of these increasingly autonomous machines. And there appears to be at least two options on the table. On the one hand, we can respond as we always have, treating these machines as mere instruments, tools, or contrivances of human action. AI scientist Joanna Bryson makes a case for this approach in her provocatively titled essay, Robots Should Be Slaves. My thesis, Bryson writes, is that robots should be built, marketed, and considered legally as slaves, not as companion peers. Now, this might sound a bit harsh, but her argument is persuasive precisely because it draws on and is underwritten by the instrumental theory of technology, a theory that has considerable history and success behind it. So this decision has both advantages and disadvantages. On the positive side, it reaffirms human exceptionalism, making it absolutely clear that it is only human beings who have rights and social responsibilities. Technologies, no matter how sophisticated, intelligent, and influential they appear or will be, are and will continue to be mere tools of human action, nothing more. But this approach for all its usefulness has a not so pleasant downside. It not only ignores machine autonomy, but willfully and deliberately produces a new class of instrumental servant or slave and rationalizes this decision as morally justified. On the other hand, we can decide to entertain the rights of machines just as we had previously done for other non-human entities like animals and the environment. And there is both moral and legal precedent for this decision. In fact, we already live in a world populated by artificial entities that are considered legal and moral persons, namely the Limited Liability Corporation. Once again, this decision sounds reasonable and justified because it extends moral standing to these other socially aware entities and recognizes that the social relationships of the future will involve not only humans, but also others, including machines. But again, this decision has a significant cost. It requires that we rethink everything we thought we knew about ourselves, our technology, and what we call ethics. It requires that we learn to think beyond human exceptionalism, technological instrumentalism, and all the other isms that have helped us make sense of our world and our place in it. And either way we go, we will inevitably run up against and encounter fundamental questions of social responsibility and the rights of others. And how we decide to respond to this machine question will have a profound effect on how we conceptualize our place in the world, who we decide to include in the community of moral subjects, and what we exclude from such consideration and why. Thank you for your time, and I'd be very happy to take your questions. And if for some reason we don't get to your question during the uh, formal Q&A period, uh, do feel free to email me, and I'd be happy to respond to you in that form, and we can continue the conversation in whatever mode uh, fits the uh, situation. So thank you again, and I look forward to your comments.